Welcome back. My next guest is here to tell you that you're never too young to start thinking about where and how you want to spend your older years. She's Dr. Muriel Shore, Dean and Professor at the School of Nursing and Director of the Institute of Gerontology at Felician University. Welcome to the program. Welcome. Thank you. Talking about where and how we age is not something that we bring up in our day-to-day -day conversations with even our loved ones, is it? It isn't, and that's really an issue that, you know, uh, we wait for the crisis to come. We know that aging is inevitable, but we're just not really planning for the years ahead. It's a problem. Okay, when should we be having these conversations? When should they start? It's never too early to begin. You really need to start with your spouse. If you uh, have one, if you're married, talk to your family. You really need to be thinking about your future and the inevitability of issues that may arise and what your preferences are. It really isn't too early to think about it. You know, we think about we're going to get married, we think about where we want to live, where we want to raise our families, but we really don't think about those older years, and that's a concern. They creep up quicker than people would like to think, and then all of a sudden they're faced with a lot of challenges, but they really haven't prepared for them. Okay, so how do we prepare? In other words, how? because I'm not thinking about my older years right now. I can barely get through the day with a three-year-old and a one-year-old, but I, you're telling me I should be thinking about that. So, so what kinds of things should I be asking even of myself and then of my spouse and my loved ones? Well, you really want to think about uh, the years ahead and where do you want to live? That's always the basic one people think about. Do in they other words, wanna... do I want to stay in this region? Do I want to go somewhere warmer? Those kinds of questions? Yes, and many people will uh, head south and then they find as they have headed south and lived there for several years that maybe they've lost a spouse or maybe their health deteriorates and then we find people are looking to relocate closer to where families are so that they'll have support. So you really need to think about uh, the type of housing. And even though you're younger and you may not be faced with those challenges, you really should have those what if conversations with your family. You know, if this should happen in my life, this is what I'm thinking about, you know, would be my plan. Uh, and you really cannot begin those conversations too early because aside from what your preferences would be, you really need the finances to support those preferences. So obviously there's a lot of other issues that you would need to address as well. So it's never too early to begin to think about it. What are some of the factors that play into the financial need of an older person? Let's take worst case scenario like someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's or perhaps Parkinson's mm -hmm. disease, but a, a very debilitating disease. Financially, what kind of strain does that put on them and their family? Well, it's an enormous strain because, you know, you really need to have the appropriate health care insurance that's going to, you know, help you support the financial need to care for that. So certainly health insurance is very important. The limitations it'll pose on family if they're going to be caring for their loved one at home or whether or not they're going to need some kind of a assisted living facility or a skilled facility. So you really do need to be thinking about if those things should happen or when they do happen that you will need financial resources. So it's not too early to be talking to people like elder law attorneys and find out how you can plan if in fact those things should occur. So put a financial plan in place Absolutely. and have the funds available if that should happen. Now what about just in terms of the, the living space that you're in, what should you be thinking about in terms of can I stay in this house? Mm -hmm. Do I want to stay in this house? Would I want to live in a group home? What are the questions we should be asking? What are the considerations there? Most people will tell you that they would like to stay in their home, the one that they feel very comfortable with in a community that they know and they're supported by. The problems, though, that's created is that often the home will not fit their needs. So as an example, stairs become a concern, whether or not they're going to be able to ambulate stairs, whether or not if they're wheelchair bound, uh, whether or not doorways would fit and accommodate a wheelchair. So a lot of times it becomes more the conditions of the home that they're living in that really becomes the issue that forces them, and I say forces them to really have to relocate, which is really very disruptive. But you really do need to think about the type of house that you live in and whether or not you have the ability to retrofit it or the uh, finances to retrofit it or you need to look for other kind of housing. What about those who say, when I get older, I really want to live with my children? Or even children who say, when my parents get older, I'll take them and I'll take care of them. Is that 
very often a good plan. How does someone decide whether or not it's good or, or, or right for them? I think it's got to be a family decision because as we know, uh, often family members are working, they're not at home to really provide the care. But certainly uh, many people do live with their family and that's their preferences. Then I think we have to start looking at the caregiver role. And a lot of times you want to take care of your loved one, but there are a lot of strains and stresses that a caregiver, you know, will now uh, face. Like what? Well, as an example, um, if you work, you're trying to balance a schedule of going to work with being able to provide the supervision of your loved one, making sure that you're there for meals or medications if they need it. What so, if they have a physical disability? Well, many times then if they have a physical disability, people will think about getting some home care if that's a potential and that's affordable and that's something that they want to do. But I could tell you this, it is really an issue when it gets to the point where your love for caring for your loved one is so strong. But on the other hand, you see that maybe their conditions are such that they need a level of care that you can't provide. You had this instance yourself, didn't you? You took care of your father. And talk about the decisions that you made to keep him home. And in hindsight, what do you think about those decisions? Well, my father lived to be 100, and he spent the last eight months of his life in a nursing home. So other than that, he did live with me. Being a nurse was an enormous advantage because I certainly understood how best to care for him. But not everyone is able to do that. But even having said that, we really experienced a lot of difficulty because I think in hindsight, we probably kept my father home longer than what we were really able to provide the care that he needed. So, um, you know, you, you love your parents, you want to do everything that you can, but you really have to look at what their needs are. So if they need a different level of care, if they need people to help lift them, uh, you know, to move them, you, you know, the one thing I found with my father, I couldn't even get him out to a doctor's office. I couldn't get him down the stairs. So we had an instance where he had a relatively minor problem, but I had to get the, um, I had to take him to an ER and I had to call 911 because I had no transport to get him there. And it was really at that point that I said, I will never do that again to my father. I knew then that he needed some other kind of placement other than what we could provide. And your mom now is 99 and she is in a home as well. For the last year, but she's 99. So again, I've been in the caretaker role. It's a wonderful experience as a daughter and as a family member, but we do need to do more to help people with caregiving. And quickly, Dr. Shore, why is this something, why is aging and aging in place and, and making these decisions about where and how we age something that Felician University cares about? Well, as an institution of higher education, we offer programs in uh, gerontology and aging. So we really, uh, we prepare the workforce that's gonna be taking care of the older adults. And we really believe that we have a contribution to make in terms of resolving some of the challenges and some of the difficulties that elderly face, not only as individuals, but their families and the communities. Dr. Muriel Shore, Dean and Professor at the School of Nursing and Director of the Institute of Gerontology at Felician University. Thank you so much My for pleasure. joining us. Life and Living has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Life and Living with Joanna Gagas has been provided by Bartley Healthcare, Wells Fargo, Gary's Wine and Marketplace, University Hospital, New Jersey Sharing Network, Partners for Health Foundation, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Family Magazine and njfamily.com. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Life and Living with Joanna Gagas has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios.